Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we gather to hear God's word on our path to looking at Jesus' cross. As we approach or get closer to Holy Week and therefore Easter, we continue to look at what Jesus is focusing his messages on. And we're going to look at how Jesus approaches life struggles, what someone is dealing with, and then how he approaches her and how he approaches us. Our order of service this morning is service of the word. It's on page 38 in the front of the hymnal, or you can follow it on the screen. We'll begin with our opening hymn, and that will be hymn 353. Hymn 353. <laughs> Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, 
according to your unfailing love, cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of your, Lord, of your Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson before us is taken from Genesis chapter 12. These are God's instructions to, to Abraham, go and go someplace. Go that way and, and I'll take care of you. They seem like almost the instructions that we wouldn't expect from God and yet, God is not calling on Abraham to figure out his itinerary or to work out all his plans, but simply to trust him, and God was going to do the work. Listen now to our first lesson from Genesis. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 121. You can find that on page 112 in the front of the hymnal or on the screen.
Our second lesson this morning is written by the Apostle Paul to the Romans. In this lesson, he draws in what it was that Abram did in our Old Testament lesson. He simply listened to God's direction and carried it out. Abraham recognized, or Paul recognizes for us that this is a gift of God, to hear his word and then to act. And that is what we receive as righteousness. Not that we have done anything for ourselves, but that God has given it to us. Listen now to our second lesson. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. This is the word of God. Our verse of the day. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson will serve as a text for our sermon this morning. John writes, So he, that is Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing our next hymn, hymn 391. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, it's nice to get a thank you note, isn't it? It's nice to get words that someone says, I really appreciate what you've done for me. But how much more does it emphasize that expression of thank you when someone does something on top of it. It's nice when someone says, I hope you feel better. But doesn't it really mean more when someone says, here, let me help you get to the pharmacist, or let me take you to the doctor. It's nice when someone says, I hope you do well on your test. 
but it really stands out when they say, here, let me help you study for your test. Let me help you with what you're working on. There is a lot to be said when people express their interest in us and tell us that they really want to help out. But how much more does it impact us when they give their time or their resources to do such? Jesus, in his ministry, had revealed many, many, many times that he was the one who was promised to come, that he was going to be the Savior. But he didn't just say the words. He expressed them one to one. He demonstrated with time. In our gospel lesson, we're going to see how Jesus approaches life's struggles and expresses his concern for needs. And that's really where we are in our life in this world, right? Full of needs. We've got this and that. We've got deadline. We've got work to do. We've got people to see. We've got things that need to get done. We're filled with needs. People say the best way to show your love is to go after those needs where people are. Let's look and see how Jesus does that for us in our gospel lesson this morning. Jesus comes right in the midst of life's struggles. He comes right to where this woman at the well needed Jesus, but she didn't even realize that until Jesus was right there. The first need is expressed in verse 4, which I added to the text. But listen to these verses from the text again. And when you hear these words, look at the different needs that Jesus addressed. What was the woman looking for? And what was it that Jesus was offering? Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he was passing from where he was in Jerusalem area and going up to Galilee. So that was the two extremes of his ministry areas, and Samaria lies right in the middle of that. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. What were those needs that the woman expressed? Well, the first need doesn't really stand out to us too much unless we look at what the customs and the times of the day were. In the middle of the day would not be the time that any old person would come to the well to get water. The women made sure that their chores were done in the cool of the day, right before the sun came out, so that they could get there and get back and not have to be out in the burning sun. But not this woman. This woman came in the middle of the day because she didn't want to be there when all the rest of the women were there. After Jesus' need to come to Samaria, he saw the need of a woman. There was also another need that was expressed there, and that was the need for Jesus to get the woman's attention. 
The woman was looking for something when Jesus was speaking, but she dared not speak. It was not normal for a man, first of all, to be talking to a woman out in public, unless there was a connection there, and there wasn't. A complete stranger never talked to a woman if she was a man. On top of that, Jesus was a Jew. He came from the people of Israel who had been brought back to the land of Israel and had been kept as a nation that God had said was going to be the chosen nation. The woman was a Samaritan. And she came from a place where it wasn't that way. The Samaritans were a group of people that had been taken into captivity from their area, taken to Babylon or Assyria or any place like that, and then they would plant others back into the country so that they could get the country to follow their regulations and their rituals and understandings. And so that would often lead to a mix of what would happen in religion or society. The Jews didn't want anything to do with that type of mix. They were very centered on what God planned through his Old Testament, and that was exactly what they did. The Samaritans started to pick and choose whether they believed all of the Bible. They only chose the first five books. And where they were to worship, the Jews wanted to worship in Jerusalem, but the Samaritans said, we can worship where we want. In fact, the mountain right next to us is good enough. The Jews would go out of their way to get up to Galilee. If they were going to go around, they went over the River Jordan and up the east side, or they went all the way around the coast. Jesus starts out with the woman's need to hear the message that he had, so he went right into against all of those social customs. The woman was kind of surprised. Why would someone like you spend time with me? Why are you even talking to me? You don't do that. That's not the way it is. Perhaps she even realized that she was there by herself and why she was there and she wouldn't go with the rest of the women. The needs that were being addressed were the needs that these individuals had, not in an outward form, but in their own hearts. And Jesus went right to that. Just a simple conversation led to addressing the woman's needs. Will you give me a drink? The rest of their conversations make it clear that the woman was just looking for an end of her chores. She didn't like that process of having to go to that well and, and go when everyone else wasn't paying attention and, and all the things that caused her problems with society were on display and she didn't want to have to keep going back for water. But Jesus used that conversation of water to draw her to see her greatest need. It's kind of like this bottle of water right here. If I were to take this to someone marooned on a desert island, and I were to simply say, yep, here you go, here's the water you need, I hope you do all right. That actually in itself would be cruelty, wouldn't it? To feel that if I just took care of her one need for a good drink of water, that that would be all that I would have to do. I've done my duty, I've said thank you, I've shown that I really care. Instead, we would expect that someone who is marooned on a desert island would be off of that island, right? We wouldn't leave them there if we really cared. We wouldn't just give them a bottle of water. We'd want to bring them where they could always get water. Very often in our struggles with what is going on with our daily lives, we see all the things that are up front and important. Getting finances taken care of, making sure that I've got enough of this or enough of that getting my chores done, making sure my work environment is all right, even worrying about my relationships. When we look at all those outward needs, we often bypass the spiritual needs that are ours. We start to think about, I have my plans and my ideas. 
Let me make sure that God fits in where I want him to when I have the time, when I have the money, when I have the relationships. It becomes very easy for us to put our focus on just simply asking Jesus, make sure I have enough water. Make sure that I get out of the hospital. Make sure that that so-and-so likes me. Instead, we miss the whole topic or the whole reason that Jesus is right here in the first place. He wants to see our hearts. And for this woman, he's going to go into a little more exercise of, of bringing that out. He exposes her sin. He points out what it is that she was doing that was not what God had asked. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Jesus does not want this woman to simply look for that drink of water and be content with that. He wants her to see where she stood with God. And when she was able to rationalize her relationship or what she had done, she missed out on what God really wanted was her heart. God's command on what marriage is is very clear. We're not to have anything that makes it appear like we're married or do anything that is reserved for marriage. And yet this woman was finding it very convenient to go through life however she felt like it. Jesus did not avoid the topic of sin. He did not say, all right, well, let me say, I'll just talk about water. Let me just talk about what you are or where you're at or who I am. He addressed where her need was with God itself. Far too often we find ourselves saying, I don't want to be the one that brings something up to somebody because they might look at me. And how much so we need that look as well. We see our own sin and we see our challenges, the things that we do wrong with our relationships or the things that we do wrong with our work. And we say, I perhaps shouldn't be talking to anybody. But there is a need. People need to hear what God says on whatever topic it is, especially as Jesus addressed the woman. So he doesn't miss it. He doesn't pass it off to the side. He draws it right in. We begin every church service or towards the front of it with a confession of sins. In fact, that sometimes becomes a little easy for us just to get into that pattern where we just think, all right, now, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. But that also can become a shortcut for us to think that all that stuff is taken care of, that we don't have to worry about it, and that it's no big deal. I've got my sins and everyone else has theirs. It's not a big deal. And we miss the fact that Jesus wants to see our sin exposed that we are the ones who need to hear the word and confess that we are the ones who have a need. How easy is it is, how easy it is for us to say, yeah, so and so is so much worse. I've done my time, I'll be better later. Yet Jesus goes right to the woman in her need and where her sin lies so that she doesn't keep piling it off to the side again, but shows that this is what God says. As Jesus exposed the woman's sin, he also shows us our need. And when the woman was content with calling Jesus a prophet, Jesus is pointing her to not use the outside words, but to look at our heart. The Apostle John reminds us as well, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The cure for sin is not to pass it off and say everyone is doing it or I, it's no big deal or I'm not as bad as so-and-so. The cure for sin is for us to recognize who has saved us from our sin. To recognize that we're the ones that need Jesus just as much as that Samaritan woman did because our sins are out there. When Jesus draws the woman in and she realizes that he is much more than just an ordinary person, Jesus brings out what he is going to do. The woman asks, Our forefathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She was content with their outward actions. I'll be all right because this is where we can worship. It's no big deal. But Jesus says, We're not interested in the place. We're interested in the heart. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. What a wonderful blessing it is that we have heard God's word time and time again. That we have heard this message and seen even the actions of baptism which wash away our sins. We receive Jesus' body and blood at the sacrament of the altar. What a blessing it is when we see that we are the ones who need a Savior. So then we don't focus on what it is that makes us better because we've got a place or that I've actually been okay, but that we are ones who have been rescued from sin itself. That the worship that God has given to us is for us and for our souls, not to be here in church once a week or so, but so that we hear the words of life and that we share this message with others. What are you looking to quench your thirst with? I could give you this bottle of water. In fact, I could sling it across the pews. I could do it in such a way that a few of you might get a drip or two. Some of you might get a gulp. But is that doing any good when I take just an opportunity to fling God's word around or the message that he has? Is it all right just to say, well, I've been in church or I've worshipped enough? No, well, Jesus wants us to drink in that water to hear that message and then let that message be seen and how we bring that message to others where we put ourselves out there not so that we can get a pat on the back but so that others can hear the word of God you see everyone who trusts in Jesus then becomes a missionary The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. What a wonderful blessing it is when Jesus approaches our struggles. He shows us our need for a Savior, that we are not on a path where we can do things on our own. And when things go outside of that path, boy, do we get uptight. But sin is to be exposed, not pushed under the rug or set aside for another time. Sin's remedy is proclaimed when we take that word of God in which Jesus has showed us that he is our Savior, and we point to him. Look at what Jesus did on that cross. He took all of your sins and mine. Those times where we were lording it over others or, or thinking that we could go around the issues. All the times that we said, I'll be content with just a drink of water once in a while. And he carried them to the cross so that they would be absolutely, positively paid for. Life struggles will often get us down. But our Savior comes to us when we really need it. 
And as we have that wonderful message that brings us life, let us also be about pointing to the Savior so that sin's remedy, the payment for sin, is proclaimed in what we do and say. Amen. Please stand. Now I commit you to God and to the word of grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are made holy. Amen. Let us now confess our faith. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Almighty Physician, giver of life, health, safety, and strength, we praise you for being with Tom, Kathy, Linda, Barry, and Shirley after recent health issues. Provide insight and direction to their doctors that they may quickly regain their strength and avoid further issues. Give them opportunity to hear your word and be strengthened in spirit. Watch over George as he is having a back procedure on Wednesday. Bless the doctors with precision and supply him with relief and recovery. Now, Lord, hear us as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. And now hear us, Lord, as we pray boldly and confidently as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to... Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 338.
We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Close our service with our final hymn. 